Uh, we just wanted to uh, thank uh, Bobby Rakova for coming in and uh, speaking to us about relational view on ethics and technology. Um, Bobby, I'll let you take it from here. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks so much team and to the team for having me. Um, so I'm a data scientist with Accenture where I'm part of a growing team called Responsible AI. Uh, but I'm also an active member of the broader fairness, accountability and transparency of AI community in um, research, which originally started, I guess, mostly from a workshop that started at uh, the NeurIPS research conference um, uh, a few years ago and now has grown into a uh, big uh, community uh, and uh, research conference that happens every year. Um, and um, previously, uh, I was a research fellow with Partnership on AI, as well as a guest editor for Springer's International Journal of Community Wellbeing, special issue publication on the intersection of AI and wellbeing. And uh, I wanted to sh share also that as part of this talk, I do not represent any of these organizations, but will only be sharing my personal reflections and collaborations in the space. Uh, so um, I'm speaking to you from the unceded territories of the Ramatu Sholone indigenous peoples. And I chose to show you this painting uh, by a young Colombian artist, Angie Vanesita, who has been doing uh, incredible environmental um, work with organizations um, um, with the indigenous peoples in the Amazon. Um, because I think it beautifully conveys the idea that we are all relationally connected among each other and the planet. So centered on this relational nature of this talk, I invite you to bring awareness to being in relationship with each other right this moment. And uh, please go ahead and post any questions and comments in the chat at any point, and I'm excited for us to discuss them afterwards. Okay, thank you for joining. I, I just now getting started and um, yeah, please post any questions or comments in the chat and we'll discuss them afterwards. Um, okay, great. So the goal for our next uh, about an hour or less together is to explore how could a relational view on ethics and technology help us create new modes of civic engagement in the way AI systems are designed uh, developed, deployed, and regulated um, in society, both by big tech companies as well as governments around the world. So personally, I've relied on two strategies, um, um, interdisciplinary collaborations in order to broaden my understanding of the relational nature of the intended or unintended consequences of AI systems as well as uh, looking at leverage points that allow us to contribute to shifting power structures in order to strengthen the voices of marginalized communities. Um, so with that, um, I, uh, someone who has tremendously influenced my relational view of the world is cyber feminist Donna Haraway. When thinking about ethics and technology in the scope of this talk, uh, we will focus primarily on AI in terms of technology which utilizes any form of machine learning or other kinds of automation. Um, while we look at ethics in terms of um, so the so-called responsible AI, but even more specifically, what Dan Haraway has framed as responsible, um, the concept of responsibility which uh, she frames as our ability to respond to the way other systems around us are influencing us. And, and in our specific case, right, we're talking about technology. So the way we're able to respond to the ways technical systems are transforming our livelihood. So uh, bringing awareness to our inherent positionality, we will start by acknowledging that no view is a new from nowhere and explore what that means in the world of AI. We will look at results from a qualitative study project in the intersection of organizational structure and the work on ensuring uh, the responsible development and use of AI, uh, exploring the socio-technical context and lived experiences of some of the people actively involved in the ethical AI field and industry. And lastly, we will look into what the future holds for the intersection of ethics and technology by bringing in perspectives from the field of community well-being. 
So starting with positionality, before I go into that, let me start with my personal positionality. So I am part of this team I mentioned called Responsible AI at Accenture. And the work on um, within this team often involves conducting so-called AI impact assessments. So this means developing a risk assessment framework uh, doing research related to how regulators and policymakers are looking to assess the impacts of a particular AI system or particular models. Uh, then also doing applied technical work in order to measure the risk along different kinds of risk dimensions. Uh, and furthermore, think about how do we deploy strategies to mitigate and manage uh, different kinds of operational, rep reputational, regulatory, and other risks um, of the particular AI models. Uh, so you can think about the financial service industry, healthcare, uh, and, and other industries, right, where increasingly I think companies uh, in industry are starting to look at uh, the, the value and of AI. Um, so how I started out in this field was true, actively engaging in the ACM Fairness Convention Transparency of AI community of practice. Uh, prior to that, I was part of Berkman Klein Center's program uh, called Assembly, uh, Ethics and Governance of AI back in 2018. And prior to that, I, I spent about five years uh, working as a machine learning engineer, which I think heavily influenced my uh, perspective on coming in, in this field of ethical AI. Um, and even prior to that, I was born and grew up in post-communist Bulgaria, where I got to learn about the complex relationship between information technology and um, the government and the social context, right? So early on in life, I was uh, very passionate about freedom of speech and access to knowledge and information. And interestingly, last year, according to the global study of reporters without borders called the World Press Freedom Index, Bulgaria has scored the lowest standard for press freedom in Europe for third consecutive year. And I think that personally, the field of responsible AI is, um, should be there to question what does freedom of speech mean in a human plus AI world? And how could we design system interventions that empower civic participation? So uh, the positionality here means a person's unique and always partial view of the world, which is shaped by the social and political context. Uh, it defines what appears as universal truths. And I think that machine learning systems have positionality as a consequence of the choices that are made in their design development and deployment. And um, being positionally aware is therefore key in order for practitioners to acknowledge and embrace the necessary choices embedded in machine learning systems by uh, their creators. Um, positionality becomes even more important when acknowledging that machine learning models exist in a certain socio-technical, socio-political, and socio-ecological context. And um, this is because there is no view from nowhere. Um, I'll refer you to the positionality aware machine learning translational tutorial that happened last year um, to look into a deep dive into positionality. But for the purpose of responsible AI work, um, I think that positionality often translates into questions such as what does it mean to remove bias from an AI model? Uh, whose bias uh, are we removing? Is it possible to do that in the first place? And one of the benefits of being explicit about our own positionality and that of the systems and technology we're building or contributing to is that it allows us to better understand and frame these questions in a way that other stakeholders can act on them. Um, on the other hand, an almost overwhelming collections of, collection of principles and guidelines have been published to address the ethics and potential negative impacts of AI. So in the past several years, seemingly every organization has, uh, with some connection to technology policy, has alter altered and endorsed a set of AI principles. Um, the Berkman Klein Center here analyzed the context of 36 AI principle documents and identify uh, thematic trends among them, which you see on the right side of this slide. 
And uh, the different colors here uh, represent the source of the principal document, either the private sector, civil society, governments, intergovernmental organizations, or multi-stakeholder groups. While the different, the size of the different dots represent the, uh, how well are these principles covered by the individual um, documents. So uh, you can see that uh, a common question uh, in the ethical AI field is still remaining, which is how do we move from principles to practice, right? Among those like common themes that have been identified. Um, a lot of my thinking in the space has been influenced by public policy regulatory impact assessments and the human rights impact assessments. There's also environmental impact assessment process uh, in practice, I'm working on assessing potential risk of particular machine learning models through a structured algorithmic impact assessment process, which often involves stakeholder engagement, as well as measurement tools that allow for a more granular understanding of the risk and uh, implementation of risk mitigation strategies. So for example, a common, common dimensions of an impact assessment framework may include um, ethics. Is the model aligned with the organization's values? Um, then bias in terms of accuracy, distribution drifts, uh, aggregation bias, representation bias, and others. Then fairness in terms of disparate impact and disparate treatment metrics, um, algorithmic transparency in the modeling methodology that's being used. Uh, there's workforce impact, for example, there's accountability in terms of uh, what is the right level of human oversight, who is accountable in, in when errors happen, and um, what is the right level of human oversight for those um, edge cases when errors are happening. Uh, there's also legal and regulatory risks. There are security risks in terms of adversarial attacks uh, that might be possible on these machine learning models. Then explainability, human agency, privacy will uh, inevitably be other dimensions of such risk frameworks. Um, many of these risk dimensions are often intertwined and their measurement cannot be automated in a linear way. So for example, consider the relationship between bias, fairness, and discrimination. So a common perspective is that various unwanted consequences of machine learning algorithms arise in some way from biased data. In the context of um, uh, our work here, the term bias refers to unintended or potentially harmful properties of the data. Data, however, are a product of a data generation process involving both sampling from a population as well as identifying which features and labels to use. So as you see here, there's potential for historical, representational, and measurement bias. Oftentimes, the data sampling method may only reach a portion of the population or the population of interest may have changed or it's distinct from the population used during model training. So uh, during the model development stages, aggregation bias arises when one size fits all kinds of models are used for groups with different conditional distributions, while inappropriate performance metrics may lead to evaluation bias that can further lead to deployment bias, which occurs when the model outputs are used or interpreted in inappropriate ways. So one idea and approach would be right, that all of the different, different kind of bias can be monitored in the first place, right? So that a team has better high level of visibility in the, um, the models that they're building and how they're behaving in the real world. Um, we, however, learn about a very different view of bias from someone like Gabriel Johnson, whose primarily area of research is psychology, perception, and philosophy of science and technology. Uh, and her work explores the relationship between machine bias and human cognitive bias. Uh, she's start studying their sources within patterns of information processing. And uh, by evaluating different bias identities, identification and mitigation strategies. She's working to show that no purely algorithmic solution to uh, bias problems exists. Um, while uh, more than 20 fairness metrics have been developed with regards to uh, this interrelationship between bias and fairness is dimensions, 
uh, recent work by the Oxford Internet Institute shows that there are implications of which metrics we're using in practice. Uh, so uh, Sandra Ocher here and her co-authors look at bias preserving versus bias transforming kinds of metrics where bias preserving seeks to reproduce historic performance in the outputs of the target model with equivalent error rates for each group as reflected in the training data, while bias transforming metrics do not blindly accept social bias as a given or neutral starting point uh, that should be preserved, but require people to make an explicit decision as to which biases the system should exhibit. Um, as one approach forward, scholars have also advocated for the use of behavioral use license agreement um, in order to enable legally enforceable uh, conditions on um, software and data uh, with regards right, to the impact of machine learning models. So one of the artifacts that exists currently in the interaction layer between human and an AI model is um, the terms of service agreement and different kinds of privacy policy agreements. However, um, they uh, do not uh, necessarily cover all the aspects that we're considering here in terms of the intersection of uh, ethics and technology. And uh, to dive into that deeper together with a collaborator, Laura Khan from Accenture Federal Services, we worked on a proposal where we identified the limitations of specifically the terms of service agreement model and proposed that a rich inter inter interaction interface could enable us to better negotiate and cooperate with an AI systems uh, system towards accomplishing the real world goals we use it for. So uh, while um, we illustrated that, that such what we call dynamic algorithmic service agreement framework could be used in the context of a recommender system. It is only um, using it in addition, right, to other existing service agreements, so not replacing any of the existing ones. Uh, so uh, we presented that work with the AAAI Spring Symposium last year in the Towards Responsible AI and Surveillance, Media and Security Through Licensing Conference track. And um, specifically, specifically, we looked at the following characteristics of the interaction layer between a recommender system and um, its users. So accommodating and en enabling change means that the interaction layer needs to take into account the dynamic nature of user preferences as well as human identities. Um, Co-constitution refers to the interdependence between identity, relationships, and information that might span across a single AI system and in different way in the, in the living uh, uh, social context right, in which it's being used. Then reflective directionality relates to the fact that model outcomes uh, from one system are often fed into another system and artifacts such as uh, self-fulfilling prophecies can develop without explicit human oversight. Um, allowing for friction calls for an interaction interface which allows people to learn more about the algorithmic outcomes as well as contest when they disagree with specific outcomes. And lastly, generativity calls attention to problematic data labeling practices used when building um, machine learning models. So uh, the idea here was to utilize this model as a way of uh, self-regulation strategy, enabling additional feedback loops between the users of a system and the different stakeholders involved in creating the system, as well as more broadly policymakers, civil society organizations, right, and, and other kinds of stakeholders. Um, this was um, an idea of how do we better organize beyond uh, putting responsibility only on the AI system creators was also um, part of the message in this recent reporting by uh, investigative journalist Karen Howell 
um, where in this recent work, she uh, conducted a study at Facebook uh, where she did qualitative analysis of their work in the intersection of responsible AI and misinformation specifically. And in this uh, recent published story, she shares about the experience of people working on responsible AI at Facebook, whose work would often be misunderstood and seen as anti-growth and therefore receive fewer sources and remain largely academic. Uh, so ultimately she highlights the role of the business model, right? Within the organizations that are building AI models and how uh, the way that the work is organized itself can impact right, the ability of an organization to address these considerations. And um, this is really what we wanted to work uh, to look at with this uh, next project I'm gonna share with you about. So uh, while there's more than 20 years of working algorithmic bias presented at academic conferences, at the core of the responsible AI work at Accenture in practice is um, about how do we make it easier for organizations to operationalize this as part of their pipeline of building products ultimately. So we conducted this study together with collaborators at uh, Spotify and Partnership on AI. And we wanted to look at uh, what is the intersection of organizational culture and structure and the work on responsible AI. Um, so the, there are two parts of this project. First, there was a qualitative study that we did. I'm gonna show you the results and we're really glad it, it got accepted at the ACM Conference on Computer Supported Cooperative Work uh, and Social Computing, CSUW, later this year. Uh, but also we conducted a workshop at the ACM FACT conference last year, and we're going to look at the results. So first of all, why should we focus on organizational structure? Because organizational structure directly shapes what systems are being built. Uh, so here formulated by Melvin Conway as what is known as Conway's law, uh, organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. So you see this is from 1968 and it's been interesting to work uh, on how and in what way this holds or does not hold true for AI systems, right? So Harvard Business School has framed this concept as the so-called mirroring hypothesis. And the, in their work, they are drawn the literature on organization design and organizations as complex systems, as well as product design and products as complex systems. And they've done a comparative analysis um, in industry uh, and uh, interestingly, even though they did that research in 2016, none of the organizations they looked at are uh, developing AI systems. So uh, we wanted to do that in this project. And uh, specifically, we also wanted to draw on uh, the field of organizational science and revisit what organizational theorists, Wander or Lekowski, uh, called the duality of technology on organizations. So that is that technology is physically constructed by actors working in a given social context, uh, while it is also socially constructed by actors through the different meanings they attach to technology. <coughs> so when humans act in an organization, they create and recreate three fundamental elements of social interaction, which are meaning, power, and norms. Uh, so here you see the structurational model of technology where we have human agents. These are the technology designers, decision makers, users, as well as um, then we have the technology itself. And lastly, the institutional properties of the organization who, that, that might be business strategies, control mechanisms, ideology, culture, the values of organization. Do we go to the office physically or work from home, right? Any kind of organizational um, uh, practices. So, and ultimately those are interdependent. So over the course of seven months, we conducted 25 uh, qualitative semi-structured interviews with responsible AI practitioners in industry. And a key criteria for the participants was that they needed to be actively involved with work on fairness, accountability, and transparency of AI within the organization, 
and their work should have some impact on real world products. So it, it shouldn't be only research and academic, but influencing the product that their organization is uh, working on. Um, so the full list of questions in the interview was 81 questions and you're welcome to dive deep into the results. Um, as an overview, the questions uh, and the main topics that were covered were uh, asking participants to describe their work. How is it related to responsible AI? How did it start? Uh, how is it situated in the organization? Um, what, what have been the biggest ethical tensions for practitioners within their, their teams? Um, and lastly, uh, how do practitioners imagine a perfect world scenario for their future work on responsible AI? And what potential future organizational structure could best enable their work? Uh, so based on the qualitative inputs we received during the interviews, we then mapped uh, what organizational structures currently support, hinder, or, um, uh, or hinder responsible AI initiatives, and what work practices are emerging uh, among what practitioners shared. So you see here the most dominant state among the common elements right, that practitioners shared, there is this emerging new state of uh, what was uh, happening in some of the organizations, but not everywhere. And then the aspirational future state that practitioners explicitly talked about when we asked them about what they wished for the future. Uh, so we found that most commonly uh, practitioners have to grapple with lack of accountability, ill-informed performance trade-offs and misalignment of incentives within decision-making structures. Uh, that are many times only reactive to external pressure in the organization. In the emerging state, uh, practitioners shared that um, the responsible AI practices are not yet widely spread uh, across the organizational level. The organization, however, organizational level frameworks and metrics are available and are being built. There is structural support and proactive um, evaluation of mitigation strategies and issues as they arise around uh, AI models. And lastly, for the future, interviewees uh, aspire to have organizations invest in anticipating and avoiding harms from their products, redefining results to include societal, societal impact. Uh, integrate responsible AI practices throughout all parts of the organization and align decision making at all levels with an organization's mission and value statements. So we share these findings, findings at an interactive workshop during the ICM FACT conference last year, which yielded an organizational level recommendations regarding four components. So the importance of being able to veto an AI system uh, the role and balance uh, between internal and external pressure to motivate uh, organizational change, um, building ch channels for internal and external communication centered on participation and inclusion, and lastly, designing initiatives that account for the interdependent nature of responsible AI work practices. So uh, how we collectively arrived at these recommendations was through situating ourselves within the so-called two-loop theory of change model developed in the social innovation space. So based on this model, we conducted an interactive workshop in person uh, back in February last year. And um, in essence, this uh, framework uh, shows a dominant system that is dying and an emergent system that has the potential to become the system of influence. So as the dominant system reaches its peak, new pioneers emerge, uh, recognizing that the dominant system, however impossible and far away might seem, is beginning to decline. It's important that this new emergent system is named and the pioneers are um, supported in order to uh, create more and more alternatives right, to the dominant systems. So, and it's important that these alternatives are being connected in what you see here, like forming communities of practice, growing coherence as a field. 
Um, it helps also when there are people in the dominant system who work to protect and enable those alternative uh, systems, alternative practices as they emerge. Uh, and that might be through funding policies or other means. And lastly, uh, there are uh, people that help keep the dominant system stable as it dies in what's called here hospice work practices, which is important because there's still a lot that is dependent on the old system until people are ready to transition to this emergent system that we see here. So the question I have for you, and it'd be really wonderful to discuss that further, is how do we transition from a dominant system where so-called ethics washing practices are prevailing in the way industry or governments address social justice issues around um, AI systems uh, towards an emerging new paradigm where uh, well-being of communities is at the center of development of um, AI systems. Um, so two nuggets of the way that we've been thinking about it. So to look for answers, we can turn to the emerging field of transition design informed by the work of Terry Orwin, Arturo Escobar, Manzini, and many others. So with this link, you can see uh, the head of School of Design and Carnegie Mellon University, Terry Orwin, introducing the transition design program at CMU where transition design is conceived as a new area of design methodology practice and research. And I think in the interest of time, I won't go into it in more detail, but um, I'll briefly share also about another framework who, uh, that I think would be interesting to look at. And I've been um, looking at myself, which is uh, systems thinking and comprehensive anticipatory design science, which Buckminster Fuller taught at MIT in 1956 as part of creative engineering laboratory classes. Uh, so there is the syllabus of his original class actually that the Buckminster Fuller Institute has put up on their resources page. Um, and I think that uh, in Bucky's view, um, uh, politics was ultimately incapable of solving humanity's basic economic, logical, and social problems. And instead, he sought to shift uh, towards design science and to look for answers. And I think that it's interesting to apply uh, this notion of uh, a broader notion of design, comprehensive or disparate design science to enable new kinds of perspectives uh, and modes of engagement in the complex dynamic systems, such as understanding the way particular uh, models, let's say financial or criminal justice um, AI models, impact the well being of communities. Which really brings me to the last section here, which uh, is going to be around. Uh, how do we turn to more broad frameworks that go beyond uh, ethics and responsible AI and look at well being? Um, so, a paradigm shift in how we measure the impact of AI systems is at the core of IEEE's recommended practice for assessing the impact of AI on uh, human well being. So the metrics framework introduced in the standard is built based on a number of existing well-being measurement frameworks used in uh, policy and sustainable development around the world, including the Gross National Happiness Index in Bhutan. Um, I was active part of uh, the working group that developed this document and also worked on a scenario of how to apply this uh, recommended practice standard in the context of autonomous vehicles. Um, and this paper that's listed first here, I think is a great overview of the uh, big standard document. Um, and here's an, an overview as well, where um, the process of measuring the impact of AI on the well-being of people, right, starts with internal analysis, uh, which um, usually uh, translates to doing what I was sharing about before, an AI impact assessment. Uh, and this uh, could be conducted by the organization that is creating the AI system. And it needs to evaluate what are the, the needs uh, of, does, does the AI system uh, uh, answer the needs of uh, 
the users in, in their particular social context where the model is going to be deployed? Is it able to solve the actual problem that is meant to solve? Uh, who are the intended and unintended users? And who are all uh, involved stakeholders, right? Who might uh, be impacted by this model? So then user engagement uh, refers to how is well-being defined in the context of the concrete AI system from the perspective of uh, specific stakeholders uh, who might be those intended or unintended users of the model. And then stakeholder engagement it would involve uh, policymakers, regulators, civil society, and other stakeholders in order to uh, uh, investigate what are the possible impacts on human well-being and identify what are the ways that we could measure that, right? And ultimately, the standard is built on these existing uh, indices and the, through this internal analysis, user engagement and stakeholder engagement, um, the, the metric framework needs to be identified and the standard proposes the creation of the so-called well-being indicator dashboard, uh, which is really the collection of metrics that uh, different stakeholders are going to be uh, utilizing in, on an ongoing basis. Uh, so these uh, metrics or indicators have been uh, uh, used to understand conditions enabling well-being to uh, in policy and sustainable development. So in the standard, they are described in detail, but uh, in general, they are based on OECD's Better Life Index, for example, the World Happiness Report Index, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals Index, the uh, Global Reporting Initiative, uh, uh, also the uh, B Laboratory Certified B Corporations Index and many other indexes. So this is a data visualization that I created, which lists all of these indices that you can read about in the standard. Um, and in the inner circle of this diagram, you see the different domains and subdomains of well-being. So, um, for the purpose of conducting the well-being impact assessment for an AI system, we first need to define well-being in the context of that AI system. So we do that encompassing these different domains of well-being, which are here affect, community, culture, education, economy, environment, human settlement, health, government, psychological well-being, mental well-being, satisfaction in life, and work. And within each domain, there are the different subdomains and indicators, right? So through the process of internal analysis, user and stakeholder engagement, uh, stakeholders are going to select which of these indicators makes sense, right, in a certain context. So um, follow-up work with it together with Springer was the intersections of artificial intelligence and community well-being uh, special issue publication. And I wanted to highlight a few of the themes that emerged from the contributions that uh, the research community made um, in, in this space. So understanding and measuring the impact of AI on community well-being emerged as the first theme. Uh, where several of the contributors discuss uh, measurement methodologies in the context of recommender systems, news feeds, uh, as well as the use of AI in public urban spaces. Um, then we had uh, engaging communities in the development and employment of AI. How is the use of AI itself a threat to community well-being and what can communities do to mitigate and manage or negate that threat? disentangling the perceived challenges experienced by specific communities, such as indigenous peoples and or informal caregivers. Uh, the authors seek to examine the ways in which AI is being developed and used currently and point to mechanism design and methodological insights that can bring about positive outcomes contributing to uh, community well-being. And lastly, the use of AI to protect community well-being from threats such as climate change, economic inequalities, gender inequality, and other. Uh, one of the articles in this uh, section uh, investigated the role of AI in improving community well-being within current models of economic growth. 
Uh, while two of the special issue contributors proposed the notion of ecosystemic AI articulating connections across pre-human and post-human intelligence through their art project involving a type of fungus commonly known as slime mold. And I will show you uh, the slime mold in a minute because I thought it's interesting. Um, so these uh, contributors leverage biomimicry and argue that environmentally responsive intelligence based on the relationships across living systems, both human and non-human living systems, right, could serve as broad uh, framework to uh, give us new insights, right, into improving community well-being. Uh, so ultimately, many of these scholars who contributed their research to the journal discussed the need for a paradigm shift, which embraces well-being at the core of uh, design, development, regulation of AI. So how, how do we do that, right? Especially with my work in industry, I see that that is not the case. And, and oftentimes there is a lot of tension, right? Ethical tensions between uh, this paradigm shift that we speak of and what is actually happening in practice. However, to look for inspiration and in the sort of relational nature of this talk, I want to bring in two examples and I'll end uh, soon, I promise. So, uh, and they're gonna be coming from the global south. So Africa, Mexico, and Colombia. Uh, aligned with the work on well-being metrics is the context uh, that um, is brought in here. Where, where African scholars have proposed Ubuntu as an ethical and human rights framework for the governance of AI, uh, urging us to go from rationality to relationality. So relational sub-Saharan African philosophy of Ubuntu uh, reconciles the ethical implications of relationality, rationality as personhood by linking one's personhood to the personhood of others. I am because we are. And uh, you can dive deeper into Salabo's work to uh, really understand from a human rights uh, perspective, right? Like what could an Ubuntu-based governance model for AI look like? Um, then we arrive in Chiapas, the southernmost state of Mexico, in order to uh, get inspiration from the Zapatistas a social movement which has had deep social, political, and cultural influence, increasingly amplifying the voices of Mexico's indigenous peoples. So this, their slogan, we want a world where many worlds fit, uh, has become the definition of what Colombian American anthropologist Arturo Escobar frames as the pluriverse. Uh, in his book, Design for the Pluriverse, Escobar talks about the role of communities in autonomous design and introduces us to the notion of participatory relational design ideas from the field of decolonial feminist political ecology, which is very much inspired by transition design, which we looked at earlier. So his work anchored in the notions of relational and non-dualist ontologies, where autonomy is understood as cultural, ecological, and political process, and involves uh, autonomous forms of existence and decision-making uh, and autonomia, in, in his words, is uh, in, involves talking about autonomy as well as the region territory. So an example he gives on that relationship is uh, from Colombia, um, developed by an organization, a political organization called Protests of Black Communities or PCN, uh, which develop these uh, political principles that represent the uh, larger community of Afro-Colombian uh, Colombians who had been geographically, politically, and economically isolated until the 1990s. So the framework developed by this Afro-descendant community, which you see here, um, uh, explores that relationship between uh, the well-being of communities and the region territory through this notion of autonomia. Uh, and here, autonomous design involves the articulation right, of what does well-being mean of a in a specific context and uh, what, are, what are the political project right, or the social movement uh, centered on the defense of the so-called region territory and what is that relationship right, with the well-being of the community. 
So the principles that uh, were articulated by this Afro-descendant community include the affirmation of identity, the right to be Black, uh, the right to the territory as the space for the experience of being, uh, autonomy as the right to the condition for the exercise of identity, the right to their own vision of the future, including the community's right to choose their own mod model of development and of the economy according to their uh, worldview, uh, and the right to historical representation. So um, what would it mean to consider the territory in a broader sense and apply this framework in the context of the virtual territory? as in uh, socio-technical systems where a uh, certain kind of AI product right, influences the way of, um, that people interact between each other uh, and, and human well-being ultimately. Uh, so in summary, I hope I've convinced you that acknowledging our positionality helps us see any gaps uh, potentially about the real world impacts of AI models uh, and further, the relational view on ethics and technology could help us articulate and position ourselves within a theory of change, as well as um, use that theory of change to more directly contribute to particular vision for the future that could uh, be more broad. Uh, and um, with that, this is the slime mode that those researchers worked on to investigate how we can learn from non-human uh, intelligence to, to contribute to human and non-human uh, uh, understanding of well-being frameworks. And yeah, I'm excited for follow-up questions and comments and just hearing your thoughts on everything that I said. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Bobby. That was great. Uh, if you have a question, if you want to uh, uh, type stack in the uh, chat, we'll go one by one or raise your hand if you'd like. Yeah, I guess I'm curious, like, do you see uh, these sort of relational aspects of ethics and technology in any of your work uh, and research or interests? Um, okay, great. I see a question. Where do you see some of the work on ecosystemic AI development? I can post the, the link in the chat, uh, and I think that... Uh, uh, this relates to, I think, the, the intersection also with environmental work and thinking about well-being, uh, not only in terms of human well-being, right? And I think recently there was really great work from Google researchers, right, Tamir Gerbo and others around studying the environmental if impact of machine learning models. Uh, so I think this is where we, um, this broader notion of ecosystemic AI that um, these researchers introduced, right, could be helpful in, in thinking about environmental impact and um, beyond like human-centered AI, right, like what, what is the role of non-human entities? So I, I have a question if I can. Yeah. Um, been, so not all, but a good number of AI applications are interested in satisfying some accuracy criteria, whether it's predicting behavior. Um, I really like your suggestion of comparing against other you know, models of intelligence and biology, but it, you know, our one way is to like only relegate our understanding of other biological intelligences insofar <laughs> as they can also perform accurately on particular tasks. What does it mean if, you know, looking at slime mold intelligence or the intelligence of an octopus or this or that doesn't satisfy our human defined criteria of accuracy, but nevertheless might have all kinds of functional advantages in AI context, perhaps 
you know, a decentralized intelligence like slime mold is more creative in certain contexts because it has fewer uh, top down assumptions and this or that. And so, what you're saying kind of suggests a whole potentially new paradigm of AI, but what do you think some of the cultural resistance to that could be among humans if, say, for instance, it were to suggest that we should care less about our predefined notions of accuracy, uh, which, you know, have all kinds of uh, yeah. imposed uh, incentives. Yeah, maybe I could start there. I think it's a really great question and really important one for actually doing things in practice and getting other people to agree on the way that things happen in practice, right? So I think that um, for me personally, um, uh, I was always questioning as a machine learning engineer, right? How do we measure accuracy on a certain test set, right? And who defines what is in the test set, right? And, and literally somebody can decide to delete something from the test set because they don't get good results for it. And, and then report their results based on a sample, right? That, that it's not truly represented, but it's not like people intentionally do that, right? But it's more often that the case that, it's, we just don't know, right? And this whole strive to build systems that generalize, right? Uh, to like unknown um, um, data sets or situations, right? And, and that's very challenging, right? There are a lot of uh, open um, issues of, uh, around how do we create models that can generalize well? And, and ultimately, like going to the other part of your question, right? Like, can it generalize beyond the human species, right? In a way, like, what would it mean for a non-human, uh, other species, right? Like what is the accuracy test set there, right? So I think that what what in this whole like research agenda right, that I guess I've invented for myself has been more driven by this idea of uh, collaboration, like incorporation around how the systems are being evaluated. And I guess in this way, designing new modes of engagement such that we can broaden the stakeholders who are um, evaluating right the system and and in that sense even even um, like environmental impact right could could be seen as part of the evaluation right and as part of how organization decides that they there's something that needs to be changed right in their how the ai system works um, yeah it reminds me of uh there was a time and it, it, it attests to the need to have even a diverse set of human perspectives right like you were saying and evaluating the ai because i remember at a, a conference AI was showing this person was showing how this AI was arriving at uh, ridiculous mistakes like you know labeling a construction like a, a bulldozer as a frog right and they're like obviously this is wrong even though we have this extremely high dimensional model but then there was this artist in the room who who asked the totally unexpected question of like well what if this isn't wrong in the sense of you have this extremely high dimensional model what if it's being poetic what if it's actually representing some level of abstraction at which it's actually accurate on the basis of that. And it was really surprising because the, the machine learning researcher had no response. They were just basically like, well, obviously it's wrong. And then the artist was like, my point is that it's not obvious. Yeah. And that was basically where the conversation ended, but it raised the problem for practical purposes. At what point do we just have to assume a very simplified form of accuracy where like we want the AI to only label bulldozers, bulldozers, otherwise it's wrong. But at one point, are we actually going to allow the AI to perhaps even update our model of what these things are, like yeah. the human model of what these things are? Yeah. And I really think this is why this notion of organizing frameworks, right, and how do we organize the work becomes really important. And it has helped me personally sort of try to figure out how to uh, do work in a way that uh, brings about like organizational level incentives for different kinds of people in an organization that could ultimately influence, right, the way that these models are being built. Really cool stuff. Thank you. Thanks. But yeah, I do wonder how can like more, how can artists get more uh, involved, right, in in this process, and yeah, people from different interdisciplinary fields. So it looks like there's another question in the slides. Okay. Says, uh, 
is there a repository or collection space for all these philosophical, ethical, technical frameworks? Maybe a hub or similar that's from uh, Alexander. Yeah, thanks. I, I would love to share the slides. So definitely, I, I, I tried to put in the resources in there. Um, beyond that, I think that uh, the discussion and recent academic conferences has been incredibly, for me, like more and more diverse. So that's been a great resource. Um, but yeah, thanks everyone. I know it's at the top of the hour already. So thanks so much for your time and hope this was uh, interesting. Thank you, Bobby. Yeah, uh, we still have a little bit of more time uh, if people have any more questions or wanna stick around and talk a little bit. I have a question. <laughs> I'm hey. sorry, I joined in late, so you might have already spoken about it and I did know, but at the end of your talk, you mentioned uh, using participatory methods mm -hmm. to uh, to try to um, uh, kind of like as, as one of the solutions. And I'm wondering, uh, like this is so difficult. How do you define who should like, who's, who should participate? How is that evaluated? What would be a success in this process? So I wonder if you can speak a bit more about that yeah thank you i really appreciate this question and i'm um, speaking from my personal experience um, with working uh, within the working group that developed this uh, standard uh, recommended practice document with ieee um, i think there the notion was that there needs to be a multi-stakeholder engagement process that can facilitate more transparency and accountability to help address what um, your question, right? Because otherwise, there there could be uh, much uh, like cultural appropriation, right, or or other negative uh, consequences, right? That uh, might uh, sort of completely uh, uh, divert the project. Uh, I think recently there was a really good paper by uh, Mona Sloan and collaborators from Data and Society Institute, and maybe I can just quickly bring it up. Uh, but I think it was interesting because it uh, was referring to, and I'll just put the link in the chat, was referring to how uh, participation is not a design fix for machine learning. Um, and they did do a great job there to talk about specifically uh, action research and other participatory methods in uh, that have been used in machine learning projects, right? And what are some of the challenges that uh, might come up? And yeah, great. Hopefully that's helpful. I think it was just earlier uh, last year that this got published. But yeah, I wish, I hope uh, to, for we will see more and more this kind of work, both in academia, but also in the industry. And, um, and that would give us really more um, um, ways to, to think about it, right, in, in applied uh, contexts. I can jump in um, with a couple of kind of platformed questions. So we'll see, we'll see if these work or not. Um, and I, I apologize also, I've been having some audio issues. So, so this may have been um, uh, within the presentation and I just missed it. Um, but the, the, the first thing is, is thinking about um, the, and, and thinking about sort of anticipatory design. Um, like mm -hmm. I, I think there's some things that we are really good at anticipating and there's some things that we're really bad at anticipating. Um, so I'm, I'm curious if, if thinking a little bit more about like what anticipatory design actually consists of, um, mm -hmm. like what are we actually able to anticipate and account for and how do we account for the things that we can't anticipate within the sort of design process and, and sort of building flexibility into the process. Um, so that's kind of question one and then um, Maybe um, this is, again is kind of like half formed, um, but um, thinking about in, in the sort of application of this is something that like I, I um, uh, study the, the criminal justice system and 
um, risk assessments are such a big part of the conversation right now. Um, and um, there's lots of different ways that people can use risk assessments. Like we often think about them in, in terms of like pretrial detention or incarceration, um, but people have also developed um, risk assessments for like encouraging people to show up to trials or, or um, identifying um, ways to, to keep people safely outside of um, jails and prisons. Um, so, so maybe that kind of fits into the sort of um, uh, participation and, and collaboration with different groups in the process. But I'm, I'm curious to hear more about how you think about that in terms of not just the, the sort of like um, technical design or the training data or things like that, but like how how people kind of formulate like what is how should this technology be used and then how does it actually get used by the, the people who are using it? Yeah, thank you for this. I think these are great questions and reflections um, to your um, first question around anticipatory design, right? And um, and the challenges right along those lines. I think that I, I've been looking at systems thinking myself and taking classes with the Buckminster Fuller Institute. Uh, and I wish I could answer that question, right? And, and I don't think it's that easy to answer, but I, at least from my personal perspective, I think the notion of theory of change and systems thinking more generally, right? Could be helpful because it sort of at least gives us some direction in terms of uh, how are different uh, looking at our work situated within a uh, dynamic complex system, right? And, and how uh, different actors interact in that system. I guess this reminds me of Bruno Latour's work as well, right? And STS uh, more generally, but um, I guess I have been turning to those kind of systems thinking methods to try and navigate that. But I completely agree with you, right? That that we don't know. Uh, ultimately, it's very hard to predict the future around around that. Um, but this is where, perhaps, to your second question, right? Such participatory methods uh, could be helpful because we would broaden the evaluation and uh, the way that different stakeholders can influence the design, development, deployment, regulation of AI systems. And related to criminal justice space, I really love the work of Kartnik and collaborators at MIT, who I think maybe two years ago, I remember hearing a presentation about their work that was called intervention rather than prediction. And the idea was to move away from risk assessment models used to predict uh, risk scores towards how do we create interventions that can prevent from the uh, offense from happening in the first place, right? And um, I guess for me, this is somewhat related again with that theory of change in terms of what is the research question we're asking, right? And how we can move towards these more broad, like perhaps community well-being related research questions. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. 